Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC 308. We are now joining through um, the book of Revelation. We are still in chapter one. Um, there's a question in the chat from Avni. Is this different from a dream? It's an open vision, not a dream. So the answer is yes. This is, uh, uh, it's different from a dream. It's not a dream. So a dream is usually something we see while we are asleep. So the body, and the body is in a rested state. Uh, and, uh, and then when we have some information God gives to us, uh, we say, okay, that's a dream. A vision is what we see, a visual that we see when we are awake. So we call that a vision. But what John is experiencing now is different from a dream and it's different from a vision. What John is experiencing now is his spirit has been taken into heaven. So we would say it's being caught up in a vision. So his body is here on earth, but his spirit is gone into the spiritual realm. And so his body is in the natural realm, his spirit is in the spiritual realm. That means he's moving in the spiritual realm, right? Example is, it doesn't mean be a bad example, but if a human goes to the moon, he's in a different environment like that, right? Just simple, but don't go too many details on that. So his body is here on earth, but his spirit is taken into a different atmosphere, which is the spiritual realm. And the spirit is actually in the spiritual realm. And he's having, he's seeing all of this. Okay, so it's different from a dream, it's different from a vision. This is a spiritual, we could say an out of body experience, we could say his spirit is in the spiritual realm. Like Paul says, I was caught up into the third heaven. He was caught up into the spirit. Ezekiel was caught up in the spirit. His spirit is leaving his body. It's, 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 it's moving in the spiritual realm. Okay. All right. I see questions from Kung below, and then we'll take Christopher. Kung, your question, please. Um, thank you, Esther. Uh, my question is like um, we're talking about like our spirit um, going to heaven and then uh, while our body is here. Um, so, Pastor, like uh, when our spirit is there, will we uh, remember like uh, in Revelation here, uh, John is and his body is on uh, on earth here, right? So, like. Um, Will he remember, like, what, is there, like, two things going on first? Like, uh, is he uh, doing a uh, normal thing there, and then will he remember what he's doing while his uh, spirit ex is um, in the spiritual world and he's experience all, experiencing all of that? So, like, uh, uh, I don't know how to <laughs> put the question across, but, like, I'm just wondering, like, uh, two things are happening to him, and we're, like, a three-part thing, and... Uh, his spirit is in the heavenly realms and uh, his body is there like uh, so like just wondering like how uh, what would would he remember would he be doing uh, the normal things there or like and, and will he remember uh, that yeah something okay. like this okay i think i understand your question your question is while the spirit is in the spiritual realm What's happening to his body? Uh, is his body going around shopping and buying things here and doing things here? And will he remember what his body is doing here on earth? Now, normally, uh, and this is not something I have experienced, but you know, if you look at other people's experiences, so at that moment, the body is usually out of touch with the physical realm. Right, so the body is suspended. You know, so example, if he was kneeling in prayer, he, he would be in that posture. Or if he was lying down on the, in his bed, or he was sitting at his desk or something, he would be in that posture. 
but the interactions of the body with the physical realm is suspended why do we say that because the Bible says James 2 26 the body without the spirit is dead now in this case he's not physically dead his body is still you know pumping blood and uh, you know all the, the physical things of the body are going on but the spirit is outside the body so it's dead in the sense that not that it stopped functioning but it's dead in the sense that it is no longer cognizant of the natural realm so in that sense it's dead okay so to answer your question while his spirit is in the spiritual realm doing things it's very likely that his body is in a very uh, it's in that state like unmoved the reason we also, you know, that's also we say because of some of the experiences that we read about in people, you know, they may be lying in the bed, they may be on operating table or things like that, where the spirit leaves, the body is there. Its blood is, you know, it's pumping or sometimes they may even physically die, but I'm just saying if it's alive, which, which is in John's case or in Paul's case, the physical body was alive, but it was not aware. Of the immediate things. Does that help you understand what's going on? Okay. Christopher, your question, please. Hi, uh, yes, thank you, Pastor. I, uh, my question is actually uh, two, uh, I mean, two parts. So when we say that John, uh, uh, his spirit went up, uh, does that also include uh, the soul? Uh, and did he require the soul, you know, his mind, his emotions, and as well as his uh, will to be able to, you know, truly comprehend, uh, you know, what he was experiencing? And uh, the second part is when we go up uh, to heaven, um, we leave our bodies behind, obviously, and we, uh, we have our spirit and soul uh, go up. Um, would that then make uh, each of us uh, unique because our soul um, is 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 unique. I mean, some are more intelligent, some have you know less control of the emotions. Wills are, the will is also very uh, you know subjective. So I just want to kind of understand those two those two parts. Mm -hmm. All right. So when we talk about our soul. Um, what we recognize is there is the spiritual side of the soul and there's a physical side to the soul. So, and the connectedness between the spirit and the soul is almost like, so we, we refer to, remember, we, we talked about the inner man. The inner man referring to the spirit, spirit, the human spirit, and the spiritual side of the soul. There's a physical side of the soul, which is the brain. Right, the brain and all the chemicals and all the okay, yeah, that's the physical expression of the mind. So if the brain is damaged, then obviously then we see some it impairs certain functions of the mind. So the physical side obviously is dead. I mean, when a person dies, the body and the brain, all of that is gone, it goes to the ground, decays. But there is also the spiritual side, which means there is the spirit, human spirit, and the spiritual side of the soul, which means that we are continuing to be aware, we think, we are able to know, we are able to feel everything in the spiritual realm. So if you want to understand it that way, I mean, that's the way I, I understand it. There is the soul, but there is a soul has, there's a physical dimension to it, the natural dimension to it, and there's a spiritual dimension to the soul, this, the eternal side of the soul, which is part of the spirit or the inner person. Right? And that is what goes into heaven or goes to hell if it's an unbeliever. So to answer your question, yes, the spirit and soul, the spiritual side of the soul is in heaven. The second part of your question is, so therefore does it mean that there are differentiators between people because uh, do the, the capabilities of the soul differ? I think based on 1 Corinthians 13, it says, you know, when we see him, we will know even as we are known. That means in the spiritual realm, 
once you step in there, then the knowledge, the knowing is something that God gives to us. And uh, it seems to imply for Corinthians 13 that God just gives all of us that equal knowledge, equal awareness in the spiritual realm. So uh, we don't know for we don't have too much scripture on this, but based on what we read, like what I mentioned for Corinthians 13, uh, I, I feel inclined to say that the knowledge in the spiritual realm is equally given. It's given to all of us. Uh, because we don't have too much information on that, so we can't say too much, but I just think that we will know even as we are known. So that God gives us all of that knowledge to all of us equally in the spiritual realm. Does that help? Uh, yes. I my I guess my just uh, additional point would be that um, you know in the, in the millennium um, when we have uh, uh, you know uh, when we are uh, when we are heavenly bodies. Uh, Along with the physical, along with physical, uh, along with physical people uh, uh, operating in that in the millennium in in on earth, um, there will be um, you know different responsibilities uh, depending on you know, the, again I think it's related to the um, the acts at uh, the uh, uh, the works that have been done by um, people on the earth so who have who have done more. Uh, they will be given larger responsibilities. I mean, these are the rewards that they, they, that is that's mentioned in the Bible. So, with that uh, added responsibilities, um, I would think that those people would also have a a much larger, not just a larger uh, responsibility, but also a larger ability to be able to to uh, handle um, you know, multiple kingdoms or multiple cities or multiple countries, etc. Um, so I, no, I, I mean, it's maybe just uh, you know a, a moot point, but I just wanted to try and you know try to get an understanding of how how unique is it, or uh, is it all sort of evenly distributed and equally distributed? Uh, you know the uh, the faculties that are uh, that are provided, the spiritual faculties that are provided to each uh, each, each person uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So during the millennium, well, everything you said is true, right? So that's how it's going to be. That uh, to the saints, saints will be given the responsibility to administer the kingdom, but the responsibility that will be distributed would be different. Uh, Jesus bears that out in Luke nineteen. Daniel shared that with us in Daniel chapter seven. So everything you said is right. So that also brings up the question: Does that mean? The saints who are now in their glorified bodies, who are administering the kingdom, will they be different in their capabilities and skills and knowledge and so on? Possible, right? Because now we are back operating in the earth realm. Uh, how would these things differ? I mean, I I, I don't know too much. Uh, we don't know too much. Uh, it's not given to us in scripture. Uh, would we all have equal information? Would we be different in our mental faculties? I don't know. Uh, it's something we can't say definitively. Uh, yeah. But your, your point, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Say your question. Oh, sorry. I think, Pastor, I was going to ask um, the first part of um, Bro Christopher's question, but just again to buttress your point about the spiritual side of the soul. A very classic example is the um, rich man and Lazarus. Even though he was in the place of torment, that's the rich man, he could still remember Lazarus. How did that happen? Basically, mm. he means the soul went with him. And mm. Lazarus could also identify um, the rich man, and he could also remember that he had brothers. So yes, to um, buttress your point and support your point, sir, we do mm. go with our soul to heaven. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good questions. 
So let's just uh, uh, continue here in the second half of chapter one. So um, John has been instructed, verse 11, uh, we were kind of dwelling on that. He says, what you see write in a book. Right? So he came back. When he had seen the full vision, he came back to his physical body. He had work to do. He sat down and he wrote everything. And he sent it to these churches. Now, what we're not sure is whether he had two separate spiritual experiences, which could be, or it was all one experience. Could be. Uh, if you go based on what we said in Revelation 4.1, Maybe he had two separate experiences, and he sent this message. Uh, he wrote this out first, and then came back and wrote the rest of Revelation. We don't know for sure. But the point you were saying is whatever he saw in the spiritual realm, when he came back in the natural realm, he was able to recollect. He was able to sit down and write everything. Right? He remembered all the details, and he wrote it down for us. So now he's back explaining. Now, he was 12 onwards. He's saying, you know, uh, uh, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Right? So again, the sense of direction in the spiritual realm. I turned to see. So this in the spiritual realm, we are operating just like how we would operate in the natural realm. That means we are able to see, hear, you know, have the sense of direction, move around, uh, and recognize the voice. And then he says, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, there was one like the Son of Man. So remember the phrase, Son of Man, used by Daniel. John is using the same, one like the Son of Man. Clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. Now, Seven golden lampstands. We know later on the Lord Jesus explains in verse 20 the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Each church, local church, being represented by this lampstand. And he is seeing in the midst of the seven lampstands, Jesus is standing there. What is, what is the picture? We're having a picture of the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, standing in the midst of these seven lampstands. Each lampstand represents one of those seven local churches. Now, we need to keep in mind that there were many, many more local churches than just seven at that time. There are probably several hundred local churches or local communities of believers by that time. So this is AD 90, 60 years after the birth of the church in Jerusalem. There were several hundred churches, many other, many cities, many villages. The gospel had reached and there were communities of believers everywhere. So John is only seeing seven. Does that mean there were only seven churches? No, there were, there were many hundred churches. What we can say, although it's not necessary, but just for our understanding, that every local church would have had a lampstand in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord Jesus is in the middle of these lampstands. So what what is being conveyed to us is every local church is in the oversight of the Lord. That's the main point. That the Lord is in the midst of all of his churches. So if you look at the world today, there are hundreds of thousands of local churches all over the world, communities of believers. So you could say there are hundreds, you know, Figuratively, there are hundreds of thousands of lampstands in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord is watching over them. Or, what is the actual essence of what is being communicated? The Lord is looking at 
he is moving in the midst, he is watching over all the local churches. They are there before his eyes. He is watching over them, checking them. And the, there is a connect between the church here on earth to the presence, the very presence of the Lord. He's watching. The other thing I want to just point out is when John is describing the Son of Man, he's talking about his head, he's talking about his eyes, his feet, his voice, his clothing, his right hand, his mouth, his appearance or countenance. So we know the Bible teaches us that God is spirit. But does spirit have a form? Or is a spirit just some, you know, cloud like thing that is just floating? No. We can see here God is spirit, but God has a form. Or the there is form even to the spirit being. So, though we say God is spirit, we are not saying God is formless. God is spirit, meaning he is a spiritual being. And as a spiritual being, he has a form. And John is seeing the form the spiritual form of the Son of Man. Just that it is so great and grand that he is using language that he, he has to express what he is seeing, but there's form. Otherwise, the head, the eyes, the, the mouth, the hands, the feet would make no sense. So, do spiritual beings have form? Yes. And in form, they are very much like the human that God created. He said, I will make man in my image, in my likeness. So the form of the human is actually an expression of the likeness and the form of God who is spirit. That's where we derive our likeness or image. So spiritual beings to have a form. And verse 17, in the spiritual realm, he's feeling touch. It says, he laid his right hand on me. So can you feel touch in the spiritual realm? Yeah. He laid his right hand on me, verse 17. And he said, Don't be afraid. I am the first to last. I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of Hades and death, of the grave and death, or the hell and death. In other words, keys are representing authority, means I've conquered, I've taken dominion over all of this. I have authority. And as one who represented us, he has conquered all of this for us. I have the keys of hell and death. He already was king. He didn't have to go and die to conquer anything. He already was king. But he did it for us. Representing us, he did it for us. He's got all authority and dominion. Meaning he's saying, these things will no longer lord it over you because He's conquered all of that. That had dominion over us, but he broke its power over us. Right? He was already king. Verse 19 it says, John, I want you to write these things, which are the things which you have seen, which are, which will take place. Right? So we explained this in the very beginning. Things that John has seen, his vision of Jesus, uh, things which are, things which will take place. Verse 20. So he says, the seven stars in my right hand represent the seven messengers, the angels of the seven churches. So 
Does that mean that there were only seven leaders? We explained earlier, angels meaning the leaders of the seven churches. Does it mean only there were only seven? No, it's just representative. It means that the Lord Jesus is holding in his hand the people he's put in leadership. What does that mean? It means, of course, there is that sense of protection, but it also means that sense of accountability. I'm holding you responsible, holding you accountable. So leaders are protected, but they're also held responsible. Okay? So this is a picture of how the Lord Jesus is relating to the churches. He is observing, he's moving among, he's watching what's going on in the church. And he's got the leaders, the angels of this church, the people responsible. He's got them in his hand to protect them, but also to hold them responsible for those churches. Okay. Say your question, please. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Um, spiritually, we can see the significance of the lessons we learned from these seven churches. But from uh, from a physical point of view, sir, um, why the seven churches? Why the Church of Ephesus, Laodicea, and the rest of them? Why why did Jesus decide? I don't know if there's another um, significance to why they were chosen. Like Jesus had to speak to these churches. Um, was there was there something about their size and number? Was there something about their influence? Was there something that was uh, prominent at that time, historically speaking, that all churches submitted to them? I, I don't know if you could help out on that, sir. Yeah. It's most likely, and I'm saying it's most likely because we don't know for sure, but it's most likely that or because of their relationship with John. So... John uh, was a spiritual elder, a spiritual leader, and he probably related to these seven churches, or these seven churches related back to him as a spiritual leader. Now we know that the Apostle Paul was responsible for setting up the church, for basically establishing the church in Ephesus. In a second missionary journey, he came through. Uh, uh, sorry, in his third missionary journey, Ephesians 9, Acts 19, he came through to Ephesus. He spent three and a half years there and he helped establish the church in Ephesus. And from there, he trained several leaders who, are, who likely went out and started these seven churches. But then Paul was taken off to Rome. Later on, he was released temporarily. He came and he put Timothy in charge of Ephesus. Now, we don't know. So while Timothy was in Ephesus, he was also responsible for the churches nearby. So he would have provided leadership and oversight to these churches. Because remember, Ephesus and all the other six churches were close by in the vicinity. You saw it on the map there last week. But we don't know what happened to Timothy. So it's likely that by the time we reach AD 90, the last decade, and we are now in around 1895, so basically five years short of the end of the first century, it's likely that at that point in time, the church in Ephesus and these other six churches in the vicinity were relating to John, or they had a good relationship with John as well. Paul had been dead by this time. He was killed around AD 68. Uh, and so we are almost talking about 30 years post his time. Timothy, we don't know whether he was still overseeing them or you know what had happened. But it's likely that the Lord is using, the reason the Lord is telling John to speak specifically to these seven churches is because most likely of the relationship they had with him and he was able to speak into them. So he wasn't, you know, he didn't say, speak to the church in Jerusalem. We don't have any 
record of the Apostle John, uh, aside from the early the days of the early church. Uh, you know, we don't have a record of him having much influence in the church in Jerusalem or the church in Antioch or other churches. So that, that would be a logical thought in why the Lord is telling John to specifically write to these seven churches. So, okay, welcome. So let's step into chapter two and um, see what is a message given to each of these seven churches. So let's read, please, chapter two, verses one through seven, the first one, Ephesians, church in Ephesians. Somebody could read it to people. To the angel of the church of the Ephesians writes, this thing says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have been found found them liars, and you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstands from its face, unless you repent. That this is you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear for the church, what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Man, yeah. So, the church in Ephesus, like we said, was a church that was founded by the Apostle Paul. Uh, in his third missionary journey, so it would be towards the latter part of uh, AD 50, uh, so close to around AD 60. Um, and uh, then it was under the leadership of Timothy, whom Paul had nurtured and raised, and so on. So, so at some point, they, you know, they would have had some relationship with John, and John must have had some influence there. Now, while John is speaking to the church in Ephesus, we don't know exactly who is the lead, who was the current leader of the church in Ephesus. But let's look very carefully at what the Lord is speaking to the church in Ephesus. So remember, this church has had a very rich history. The Apostle Paul himself was there in establishing the church. And uh, Timothy was nurtured by the Apostle Paul himself, was one of its leaders. So, very rich history. The Lord is saying, verse 1, that he is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So this is something we mentioned earlier. Now the Lord is moving among his churches. He's walking, he's seeing, he's observing. He's moving among his churches. And it's very interesting. He's saying, look, I know, verse 2, I know. That means the Lord knows what is going on in every local church. The churches that are you know, made up of His people. We're not talking about churches that are namesake churches. We're talking about people who are His people, right? His church, born-again people. So I know what's going on. And he had, a, he had a lot of good things to say about the church in Ephesus. So they were, they had works, labor, they were enduring. I'm looking at verse two. Uh, they couldn't bear those who were evil. That means they were a very godly, righteous people. They were even very discerning people. So let's say, you know, they were they were people who were very diligent in their walk with God. Uh, they were also very discerning people because. They tested those who called themselves apostles and found them liars. So there were people, even in those days, 
who were imposters. That means they were pretending to be apostles. They were not. Right? So, and they were very discerning about that. Right? It's very discerning church. And they were also very determined, verse 3. They persevered, they labored, they didn't give, they didn't get tired. So if you want to sum up, you know, the church at Ephesus, they were very diligent in their serving God. They were very discerning. They were very determined, committed people, godly people. So, you know, you could say like good marks and all these things. Very good. And yet the Lord points out something he says is very serious. Very serious. Because in verse 4, he says, I have something against you. I got a problem. What's the problem? You have left your first love. That means you have departed. Left meaning it's not they've lost. It means they have moved away from. So you departed from your first love. What is supposed to have been your primary focus, your first, the, the place of your first devotion, you know, first in rank and time, in place in your life, you've gone away from that place. You've departed. You left. So priorities got mixed up. It's not that they have lost their love for the Lord, but their love for God has now gone lower in priority. It should have been first, but it's now gone lower. They have left. So you ask them, do you love the Lord? Oh, yeah, we love the Lord. Do you love to worship? I love to worship. Do you love his word? I love his word. Do you love the Lord? Yes, I love the Lord. So they have love. They've not lost their love, but that love for the Lord is not first. It's gone down in priority. What is the solution? Verse 5. So, so verse 5. So what does that mean spiritually? He says, and he uses strong words. Remember from where you have fallen. This is a spiritual fall. Now, we don't tend to think about it like that. Hey, if my love for the Lord is not first, maybe it's second, maybe it's third, maybe it's fifth, I don't know. It's a fall. It's a downgrade of my spiritual life. Remember from where you have fallen. And then he says, repent. So here's something to think about. Do believers need to repent? Yeah, that's a big discussion. Some people say, oh, believers don't need to repent. You know, you, God has already forgiven you. Your sins are already washed. You're under grace. You are the righteousness of God. Well, just look at this. Jesus is speaking to them. He acknowledges in chapter 1, like we saw, I have loved you. I have washed you from your sins. I have made you kings and priests. That was Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. And yet to the same people he is saying, you need to repent. So is repentance 
part of the Christian life or is it only for the unbeliever? Well, Jesus is telling the church to repent. So it is a part of the life of the believer. So he's telling them, repent. Have a change. To repent means have a change in your thinking, which will then be expressed through your living. So it starts with your mind. Repentance is a change of mind. But then it has to be expressed through how you live. So he says, repent and do the first works. So think about this. How do I express first love? By doing the first works. So the life of grace is not a life of works, but it is a life of works. Meaning, we don't work to attain grace, but we work out of a place of grace. Because my first works are an indicator of my first love. I cannot claim to have first love without first works, according to Jesus. So, he says, repent and do the first works, which means my first works are works that express my first love. It's my worship, my love, my adoration, my expression of devotion to Jesus Christ. You know, reading His Word, praying, seeking Him, putting Him first. So first love is expressed through first works. We can't say, well, you don't need works. Jesus said, repent and do the first works. Because that's the only way he can tell where your first love is. So these people had works. We saw that in verse 2. I know your works. But those were the works of the ministry. Those were the works of the church. What's he calling them to? I want you to do the first works. Which is expressing your first love to the Lord. Would there be a consequence if they don't repent? The consequence is very severe. Verse 5. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That means this church will no longer have a place in his presence. That means the church would be continuing in the natural world. Oh yeah, they're having a church, they're having services, they're having meetings, they're doing ministry, whatever. It's continuing in the natural world. But in the spiritual world, there is no connect with the head of the church. And the body without the head is dead. So just think about this. How important are is maintaining our first love? and doing the first works, both as individuals and as a community. Right? So you can look at it both in both levels. For me as an individual, I must maintain my first love by doing the first works. And as a community, because he's speaking to the church, as a community, we need to make sure we maintain our first love by doing the first works. Otherwise, our place in his presence will be lost, which means the activities will go on, but there's no connect with the head of the church. Okay. All right, we have a few minutes. Say what's your question, please. Yes, Pastor. I, I was just trying to wrap my head um, to ask, or rather, I, I, what was going on in my mind to ask is, how do we as leaders um, unconsciously um put our members in the motion of just service at the expense of their fellowship and then 
if that's a possibility, how then as leaders, how can we ensure that we are not encouraging our members to be fully focused on the service at the expense of their fellowship? How can we ensure that they're putting their fellowship and their relationship with Jesus first before any other thing, which is service? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is the response. You know that is a responsibility um, that leaders carry. Uh, the way we would approach it is, first of all, uh, to hold ourselves at a personal level to make sure that we have this in order. That in our own personal lives, make sure that we are maintaining our first love and our first works. Because if, as a leader, I get distracted like what we read here in Ephesians 2, um, uh, Revelation 2, if I get distracted and if I lose my first love and seize on my first works, then I wouldn't even recognize it when it's happening in the church. So it begins with us as leaders. Then we constantly make sure that, you know, I'm keeping my first love and doing my first works. That's one. And second, we have to watch over the people of God and communicate to God's people. Hey, we are all doing ministry. That is good. But more important is our devotion to the Lord, our first love and first work. So in both in our teaching and preaching and in some in practical ways, we call the church back. Hey, maintain this, maintain this, maintain this. We yes, we have to do ministry. We are doing service, but come back. Keep stay in this place of first love, first works, first love, first works, and let's flow out of that. You know, so constantly reminding people on that. So these are two things we can do. Okay. Thank you, Papa. All right. So. Yeah, so we have just two more minutes left. I'll, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do verses six and seven next week. And, uh, yeah, or maybe just do this. So, uh, verse six. So there was this group um, or a sect of people called the Nicolaitans. Um, not much is known historically about this group, but some things we can say about this group. Uh, one, but the name, the meaning of the word Nicolaitans. Nico means to rule over. Laitians means laity. So this was a group that, 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 that were, you know, they ruled over, they dominated the laity, they suppressed the laity. So just from the name, that's what they did. But we also can understand that they, practice immorality and idolatry, as we will see later in another church, because the same group was operating in another church as well. So they were immoral and practiced idolatry. So the church in Ephesians identified this sect, identified this group, and said, hey, we are not going to participate. So he says, you know, you hate the deeds of this group, and I'm commending you for that. So the church in Ephesians, again, is a very discerning group. They discerned the false apostles. They discerned this sect which was trying to influence them. Right, and then the Lord, verse seven, He 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 gives them the promise to overcome of the tree of life, and also a place in the paradise of God. Which again, we just point out that at that time paradise was in heaven, unlike the time before the crucifixion, which paradise was in Abraham's bosom, lower parts of the earth. Now paradise is in heaven. Okay, anyway, we'll pause here. We'll pick this up next week and move forward. Uh, could somebody close in prayer and then we'll dismiss, please. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord, for teaching these profound things from the living world. Lord, as we understand these hidden treasures of prophecies, Help us, Lord, 
to receive it well into our hearts and spirits so that we may read it understand it and know it and keep it keep those things which are said and spoken in the world that we will be blessed blessed person exceedingly and abundantly and use him in the days to come to teach the deeper things into us bless everyone of us we thank you for hearing our prayer in jesus name we pray amen amen man thank you everyone uh we'll take a break see you in the next class god bless bye now thank you first